Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Machinery Safety Webinar brought to you by Pilts Automation. Today, we're going to be covering the standard 13855, which is positioning of safeguards with respect to the approach speeds of the human body. I'm your presenter for the day, Jamie Thomas, and uh, answering your questions will be Jamie Walton and Andy Maskell. So you can type any of your questions into the toolbar at the right hand side of your screen and the guys there will, will answer them. They are anonymous questions. Um, if any of the answers are a bit longer or a bit uh, more detailed, then what we may do, if, if it's okay with you guys, is, is maybe contact you back after the, after the webinar. You'll automatically also receive a link to the recording. So you can watch this back at a later date if you if you have to get up or if you want to show it to any any of your colleagues. Um, and and also the slides should be available to download. So during this webinar, what we're going to cover, uh, we'll have an overview of the standard 13855. We'll go through some of the technologies applicable to the standard. So light curtains, scanners pressure sensitive mats, two hand devices, interlocks, fail safe radar. Um, we'll go through the calculation, the S cross K times T plus C calculation, um, and we'll cover reach through and reach over, something that some people aren't aware of. And we'll go into the more detailed calculations, the, the adaptations for scanners and radar, and then also how to measure the stopping time of a machine and the importance of that. The standard, ENISO 13855, position of safeguards with respect to the approach speeds of parts of the human body. So the aim of the standard really is just to make sure that when somebody goes through a safety device, whether it be a light curtain, whether it's opening a guard door, um, then the, the machine has come to a standstill before they can reach any hazards and they do not come to harm. So. The standard was harmonised, or as it was at the time, now it's called designated in 2010 and replaced EN 999. And within this standard, it specifies some parameters based on values of, of approach speeds to a hazard. And there's only two values given here. So we have um, upper arm limb movement at 2000 millimetres per second, and this is your initial value at which you would do your calculations and if your safety distance comes out at greater than 500 millimeters you can then recalculate using 1600 millimeters which is classed as a walking speed um, <clears throat> and the reason that you would go you you can go to the walking speed at anything over 500 millimeters is because you've determined that you won't be reaching in to the hazard, you'd be more approaching the hazard um, of, of the full body. And the speed for upper arm limb movement is uh, greater than walking speed because your arm limb, your, your arms will move faster than generally than you will walk. Um, and we're, we're often asked as well also, uh, but what happens if somebody's running or they fall or they jump into the hazard? Well, there's no no guidance given for this. This is not considered um, one that probably too much of a variable. Um, two, you, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, so what we've got is just these two set parameters for upper arm limb movement and walking speed, and these are the things that we apply. The standard is structured uh, in the same way all standards are, um, with the sections. So one being the scope, section one, and this is what the standard covers, what's applicable, and um, if it's not in there, it's not covered within the standard. Two is the normative references. So these are other applicable standards. So you can see here we've listed 12100, which is your risk assessment standard, uh, which is the only A, to A standard in the pyramid of standards. Then we've got some B standards, which are 13857, which is reach distances and 61496, which is electro-sensitive protective equipment, or, or better known as light curtains and floor scanners. 
Um, section three is terms and definitions. So this will explain um, any of the terms used, symbols, abbreviations, whatever it may be. So if you look at something and you don't quite understand what it means in the standard, you can check section three and it should give you guidance on that. Four is methodology. Uh, in this case, it will be how we approach the calculation. Five is the equation. So S equals K times C plus C. Then we get onto some more specifics in, in the next section. So uh, section six is to do with like is to do with generally light curtains, laser scanners, um, and how they're mounted, planes, positions, and and guidance on circumventing. Seven is just pressure sensitive mats. Section eight, two and control devices. Section nine is guard locking and interlocking and about how when to make the decision between whether you just interlock or whether you need to do fail safe locking. So basic methodology, as with any um, project application that you're doing, the start point is a risk assessment. And that will be done, as we said before, in the 1200 risk assessment standard. But during this time, you've got to look at your machine as well and identify if there are any machine specific standards or C standards for this. Because um, <clears throat> if, if that's the case, then the C standard will always take precedent over any A and B standards. And there's a lot of guidance given. They're generally written by experts in the in the particular field that the machine uh, is manufactured for. And it will give you guidance on common hazards, um, suitable uh, and sufficient um, risk reduction measures. But as we said before, you see we've, we've listed EM415 part six for pallet wrappers in here. Uh, and this is because that particularly applies when in conjunction against 13855, because within that standard, there's guidance given dependent upon the stopping time of the pallet wrapper and the number of beams of which the body detection light curtain has. And it's, uh, I think the values are 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 for the stopping times and three and four being um, light curtains. And dependent upon that, you can put them um, either 900 mil or 1200 mil from the hazard regardless of what the 13855 stop performance calculation comes out with. So as we were saying before, the C standard will trump the B standard. So you can, as long as you follow and you have compliance to the specifications in form five part six for the stopping time and the number of beams, then you can mount them as per the standard, even if 13855 comes out with a larger um, safety distance. If there's no C stop standard, then you must apply and validate against 13855 um, and let us know uh, and see where we uh, are. We also got to consider circumvention. So this will be, um, yes, you've got your light curtain, but also then how do we make sure that nobody can get round or in between so this is where you'll have your, your combination of safeguards. So you'll have your light curtain, then you'll have guarding, physical guarding probably surrounding that. Um, and you need to make sure then that, that that of the guarding is done. Consideration must be given to resetting also. So um, you gotta make sure for one, that the machine, the guard can't be reset from within the danger zone. So you can't stand inside the guarded area, reach around the light curtain and press a reset button and restart the machine with you in there. Sounds quite obvious, but it has been seen on machines in the past. But also that the machine might be reset with somebody else in that's maybe in a blind spot. And there's various ways of doing this. You may use a, a, a kind of a preset reset button at the blind spot on the, the, uh, the machine in the, in the dangerous area where you will force a reset um, procedure, you may go in, press that, it will give you so many seconds to get out of the danger area and then an external reset will become active and you can reset the machine from there. 
or it could just be that you use um, occupancy detection devices. So although you've gone into the reset, you've gone through the light curtain, then there's something else that's detecting your presence in, in the danger zone or within the area of the machine, within the guarded area, all the time that you're in there. So the safeguards that we'll look at can include um, light curtains or um, AO, AOEP, uh, AOPD, opto, active optoelectric protective devices, scanners, so two-dimensional laser scanners, and vision systems. So you can see here, which is our uh, safety eye, and also the P7 VIP, which is a press break camera. All these devices must have their stop times calculated to show that they are positioned correctly. And these devices come in different types. So type two, type three, type four. Type two devices, um, since the change in 61496 in 2015, will now only achieve a performance level of PLC. They would previously achieve PLD, and which made them very common in robotic applications, where because 10218 part two states a minimum requ required performance level of PLD cat three. Um, that standard still makes that statement. However, type two devices can no longer meet that. So you need to then look to a type three or type four device to ensure compliance to 10218 part two. Top three devices, um, most laser scanners, vision-based systems, uh, vision-based camera systems are type three. Uh, at Pilts, we manufacture a type three light curtain also. Uh, I'm not aware, aware of another one on the market. Um, I stand to be corrected on that, but I'm not aware of one. So what that means then is actually if you require performance level D for your application, then you can buy a suitably um, priced light curtain for that application as well. And if you need PLD, You'll have to go down the route of type four. So um, <clears throat> they are light curtains, single beam, electrosensitive protective equipment, uh, and also our PCM VIP press break camera. So uh, yes, yeah, so just to recap, type two devices will claim, you can claim PLC. Type three devices, you can claim up to PLD. And if you need PLE, you'll need to go for a type four device. Scanners, this is the Pilts laser scanner that you can see here, but what they are are 2D area monitoring devices capable of PLD. Um, they're type three as per 61496, as we mentioned in the last slide. Um, you can often see laser scanners used in a variety of applications, whether you've got a, uh, a master and then some slave versions to give you a larger area um, with the main control coming from the, from the master unit. Um, they have big, Warning zones, we've got a 40 meter warning zone with a 5.5 meter safety zone. They'll scan an area up to 275 degrees um, in various resolutions. Um, and their reaction time, and, and this is a, a key point to remember with scanners when you're doing this, we've got a reaction time here of 62 milliseconds, which is a two scan reaction time. So the, the scanner will, will look across its field field of view and if it picks something up in the area that it's not meant to see it then it will scan a second time and if that it picks it up again then it will detect a, an issue and turn the OSSD outputs off. With scanners you can increase the number of scans especially sometimes people maybe have nuisance tripping. So if you go to three scans then our reaction time will become 92 milliseconds, four scans, 122 milliseconds, and so on and so forth. It's just important to remember that if you're getting nuisance tripping, you've got a floor scan and you decide to increase that reaction time, then you've got to have a consideration back to your stock performance calculation. But the way they will look at is the floor scanner will look at an area that it expects to be clear of any obstruction. If an obstruction becomes in that area, whether that's a person, whether that's product, whether it's a toolbox, pallet, whatever it is, then it will see it as a, as a hazard and stop the machine. 
pressure sensitive mats uh, or safe edges, bumpers. There is a standard for all of these, which is 13856. And these may operate in various ways. It may be that uh, you see the robot cell in the picture that if you stand in a certain position, then the robot cell will only work in the opposite side of, the, of, of its working area. Or it might be that it stops completely. Or um, like with safe edges and bumpers, you know, they, they will wait to be detected. So if you get in the way and you touch them, it will stop. Uh, maybe often seen them on bay doors at the bottom of bay doors to make sure that people don't close them on you. So, uh, but there is a standard again specifically for these, and it's 13856. Two hand control devices, um, standard for these is 13851. And these must be mounted in a fixed position. So, the whole idea of it is that they are away from the hazard and sufficiently away from the hazard that you if you let go of the, the buttons you cannot then access a dangerous situation or moving parts of the machine <clears throat> so 13851 you say get replaced the n574 um and what it does it covers two different it will have two different types of um or performance levels for the two hand controllers we do some relays, the S6.1, which will give you performance level C for a two-hand controller. And this will still have redundancy in each button. However, they're just two normally open buttons. And when they're both made simultaneously, and that's a key point for two-hand controllers, there must be simultaneous actuation. So that means that one button can't be wedged down and then just use the second button with, with one hand to defeat the object of the, of the device. Um, but if there's simultaneous actuation of both the buttons with both normally open contacts, the machine will run and this will give you performance level C. To gain performance level E from a two hand control device, um, our relay is the S6. Uh, and this works on a, a polarity change. So you can see from the, from the diagram, you've got S11, uh, uh, S12, S21, and S22. So We've got button one, button two, S1, S2. You've got a normally open and a normally closed contact on these buttons. So what we're looking at here is we're looking for a change in polarity when the button is operated. So you will have a positive signal and a negative signal down the two channels, and we'll be watching for this for this value to switch over. Uh, from negative to positive and so on and so forth as the buttons are pressed again simultaneously and that's how you can achieve performance level E. Interlock guards, standard for this 4119 replaced uh, 1088 back in 2015 although it was designated harmonized in 2013. Um, there's two types of devices which you're going to use on guard doors, which are interlocking devices, non-contact, or guard locking devices, where they have a fail-safe locking function. The non-contact devices, which are in the red box, um, previously we would, you would have had electromechanical devices for this, which may be able to do a magnet pulling two physical contacts. And yes, you, used to be able, you can get coded magnets and so on and so forth but they don't give you a high level of code to prevent defeat. Um, and the standard talks all about motivation to defeat and what to do in table three regarding that. Um, but also they leave themselves open to fault masking when you series link a fault free contacts and you can no longer claim any diagnostic coverage for a circuit where you've got fault free contacts series link for the purpose of interlocking. So what you would generally look at now and we see more on the market uh, and as a product manufacturer, we, we we sell a lot more of the RFID technology switches. Um, these switches, all these non-contact switches will be used in applications where you can open the door and the machine comes to a standstill sufficiently fast enough that nobody can get in touch with any moving parts and therefore harm themselves. If you determine that the guard door, once opened, still enables somebody to reach a uh, some moving parts or slowing down and harm themselves, then you would go for a 
guard locking device. And the key points in this is that the locking device must be power to unlock, and that unlock signal must be sourced from a failsafe output. Um, keen to point out that we're talking about personnel protection here, not the protection for the for the machine to stop somebody opening it mid-cycle um, and either leaving the machine in a position where it needs to redate them or, or bring in um, fast-moving machinery to a sudden stop. It's for personnel protection where you determine that somebody can reach a hazard before it comes to a standstill via opening a door. The interlocking function is also performed. We've got the M-lock there, which you can see, which is a PLE. Uh, device, 7,500 newton pieces holding force. We do it in a high level of code and proven in use to over a million cycles. So we default exclusion to the single point failure on the tongue is made within the switch. Uh, and that gives you your interlocking and your mechanical um, fail safe personnel locking as well. So you can see here from this little flow chart, where do we, how do we determine to lock or not to lock? Start, you calculate the overall stopping time on the machine. Um, is, the dis is the guard sufficiently far enough away from the machine? So you would do S, which is your distance, and you'll do K times T. So your approach speed, whether it's 1600 or, or 2000, and T, the overall stopping time on the machine, you will calculate that distance is the guard far enough away um, or is it closer? If it's if everything's okay, then you can go with the interlocking device. If it's determined that your guard is too close, then you must go with the locking device. A fairly new product to us at PILPS, uh, well, last a year to two years, is the Bale Stage Radar. Um, and this is a volumetric uh, device, previously used to be just for occupancy detection, as it's PLD CAP2, but we now have PLD CAP3 version. Uh, and this works by detecting movement, so it's, it's uh, opposite to the floor scanner. So as we said, the version 1 was PLD CAP2, version 2 is PLD CAP3. Uh, volumetric, um, it's not a replacement for a floor scanner. Uh, they're not uh, as configurable um, and the resolution is slightly lower, uh, but it does have other benefits. So um, it's it's insensitive to, to dust or smoke if you've got um, in dirty environments. If you've got welding applications, sparks won't set it off. You can put it outside, it won't be bothered by the rain. Uh, and it's also good for um, changing static environments. So if you're going to move things in to that area where a floor scanner would pick it up and see it as a hazard, um, this looks for movement. So if you walk in or someone drives in or something goes in, it will turn the OSSDs off while there's movement going on and then they can restart once they leave. There's anti-tamper um, and uh, anti-tamper features built in by uh, inclinometers um, and things like that. So um, but there's calculations for this, which we'll go through in the next section. So the safety distance calculation is, which says a couple of times, S equals K times T1 plus T2 uh, plus C. So as we said before, we will start with an upper arm limb movement speed of 2,000 millimeters per second. Um, and then when the calculation comes out, if the if it's positioned great, if the calculation is greater than 500 mil, we can revert to 1600, which is a walking speed or a body speed. If you do this calculation and then you come back out at less than 500 millimeters, you must turn revert back to using 2000 as your K value, um, because then you you could still reach into the hazard with an arm very easily from the value and, the, and then the uh, uh, the safety distance wouldn't be wouldn't be valid. T, uh, often just referred to as one value, but it is T1 plus T2. So T1 
will be the um, response time of the safety related parts of the control system. So that would be your input device, whether that's your light curtain, floor scanner, radar, um, guard switch, the time it takes that to react, send the signal through to your evaluation device, so your logic device, that could be a standard safety relay, it could be a small program controller like the multi, or it could be a full-blown safety PLC like the PSS 4000 or, or the uh, many others that are on the market. That in turn has to um, either give an output or remove a signal for the output device, which could be contactors, drives, uh, dump valves. So there's the safety, there's T1. The stopping time T2 is then the mechanical stopping time. So how quick does the, once all the signals are removed, how quickly does the machine physically come to a standstill? Is it braked? You got what safe stops have you got? If safe stop zero, then it will coast to a stop. Safe stop one, it may be braked and then uh, and then power released. Safe stop two, obviously, is braked and then power retained. But you can you've got to consider all them all that in there. So uh, and this this section is the part that must be physically measured. And there's different ways of doing it. We'll come on to that later on, but it really should be physically measured. And then C is the intrusion distance. So it's how much of the body can pass through the outside of the protective field before the sensor is activated. So um, you have to look at, you have to consider that. Um, and that's where we have uh, is the um, resolution of the device is key. Um, but what we've got there is we're talking, and that's for reach through, but we've also got to consider reach over. So if that's you going through the device, that, that's the resolution, reach over is dependent upon the height of the hazard and the height of the protective device. And then there's a table which we'll look at in detail and gives us guidance on what that, which one it would be. You do the two calculations and you use the largest value for the C value. So whether it's CRT or CRO, you have to use the largest value. Radars, scanners, they also have, they will have some different or additions at this part of the uh, calculation. Um, and we'll, we'll go into the detail on them later on. So reach through. So if we have a look, the calculation for reach through, um, when we get to C is eight times the value, the, the, the resolution of the light curtain minus 14. And the reason for that is that finger detection light curtains are for, the beams are 14 millimeters apart. Therefore, it's determined that nothing can pass through the light curtain without triggering it. So for finger detection light curtains, the value for C is zero. And resolution, Light curtains, they're generally 30 mil. Sometimes we do a, some, we do a, 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 a series at a 24 mil. But what you would do, so it would be eight times, and in brackets, 30 minus 14. So we would bring that out then at 128. For the 24 mil resolution ones, they're still classed as hand detection because a finger could pass all the way through before it being detected but that is 24 minus so, so it's eight times 10, which is 80. Body resolution, light curtains, they are ones that are greater than 41 millimeters apart. And it's determined there that you would use the Euronorm arm length of 850 millimeters because a full arm could pass through the light curtain before the body, the full body forces the triggering or of the of the device so when you look at it you'll go from one end of the scale of c is value c value is zero for finger detection or the c value is up to 850 for the body detection like that so if we have a look and we do some calculations and see how this would affect the safety distance 
So you have a body, you have a body resolution light curtain to protect an area where the stopping time of the machine is one second. Okay, so we're going to use the value, the walking speed value of 1600 millimeters per second for K. Uh, T1 is 20, millime 20 milliseconds for the safety relay, 20 milliseconds for the light curtain is 40 milliseconds, and one second for the machine stop time. Uh, it says the high inertia. C value is 850 because we said it is a uh, body detection light curtain. So we will be saying 1600 times 1 plus 0 0.04, and then we add 850 as a value, 2514 millimeters, so over two and a half meters away from hazard. If space is a premium, as it is in many factories, um, and you want to re reduce that, then you say, okay, well, let's have a look. Okay, a finger detection light curtain is probably going to be a little more expensive because they're more beams. However, it will reduce space. So if we put that into the value, we can remove 850 straight off that that end distance, and it takes us down to 1664 millimeters. So a bit over a meter and a half. So it's quite a big saving, especially if you've got multiple cells. The, this this can be multiplied over over many many times now we do look at the reach over so if we have a look the height of the light curtain is 900 mil okay and the lower edge of the light curtain must always be must always be no greater than 30 millimeters because otherwise it's deemed that you can crawl under the light curtain and we would look, so the height of the light curtain is, is going across the top, which is called the upper edge of the detection zone. And down the side is the height of the hazard. So the height of the hazard zone is, is determined as two here. And we can cross reference over to what, they're, what they are. There's areas that are zero. Um, and that means that it's not possible to reach over um so then you go back to the reach through distance so it's basically saying that if your um if your hazard is 200 mil from the floor and your light curtain is a thousand then you have to go to reach through because it's not possible so you can't use that value in the table so if we perform both calculations, we'll have a look and then we'll use the larger safety distance uh, out of the two. So if we have a look at the reach through now, what we're gonna say here is we have a hazard that's 1700 high and the top beam of the light curtain is 950 millimeters from the reference plane. Well, we start with the height of the hazard down the side we can see that it jumps between 1600 and 1800. Well, we've got 1700, so we have to always take a worst case scenario. So we go up to an eight, a value of 1800 down that left hand side. The top beam of the light curtain is at 950. So we go between 900 and 1000. So in this case, we have to go down as the worst case scenario. So we're going to look at 900 and 1800. We Put that across the reach over distance is 1.1 meters or 1100 millimeters that is greater than the reach through distance so when we put that into the calculation reach over comes out at 2.7 meters whereas reach through was just over two and a half meters so the light curtain must be fitted at 2700 millimeters from the hazard to prevent both both reach over and reach through. I hope that's uh, clear. So far, we've just looked at orthogonally or vertically mounted light curtains, uh, but the standard does allow us to consider mounting either angled or parallel. In this, these uh, pictures, an example of a press. And you may choose this method uh, for mounting to allow detection of both entrance to the danger area 
and also to maintain detection for somebody that's still within the area. So if they walk in and they're going to be um, performing a task within that area, then you want a detection. You want to make sure that they're still there. And this will be right up to the edge of the hazard point, so, so nobody can get between this device and the hazard. Um, the distance from the floor for any parallel light curves must be less than uh, 1,000 millimetres. Because this takes into account someone trying to step over the first beam, so the light curtain, but also someone trying to crawl underneath. Um, but whichever way you look at it, mounting something either angled or parallel is going to be a bigger safety distance than the vertically mounted light curtains. And we'll have a look at what this means. So if your angle, uh, you use the beta symbol for this, is at 90 degrees, S equals K times T plus C calculation applies with no extra distances or safe, safe factors. The C value is based on the resolution of the light curtain, as we've said, and in these cases, it's demonstrated that a body detection light curtain, uh, hence the 850 arm length value. It's worth highlighting actually at this point that single beam devices will have uh, 1200 mil for value C. And the standard also gives recommendations for the heights of the beams of body detection light curtains. Uh, you see this little table there which talks about number of beams. So if you've got four beams, they should, they're recommended to be uh, 300, 600, 900, 1200. Three beams, 300, 700, 1100. Two beams would be 400 and 900, and if you've got a single beam device, it's 750. And they are heights from the floor. Um, the parallel approach, if we look at that a little bit further down, this gives a safety distance, you've got your K times T, but, it's, but then the C value is 1200 minus 0.4 times the height of the light curtain. And this has a big effect on the safety distance. Um, because it's going to be a lot higher value. So, um, but this is also included uh, in the scanner and radar sections of the webinar uh, later on, and it's also a consideration into the standards there, so into into the calculations there. So basically, the height that you are going to mount your um, light curtain from the floor uh, in that horizontal plane um, times 0.4. Uh, you can take that away from the from, from the value of 1200, but it's going to give you quite a big safety distance. So if we do the comparison, we've got a T value in this application of 16 uh, uh, 160 milliseconds. We're going to use a finger detection light curtain, 14 mil resolution on the left hand drawing. And we have a height of 500 mil for that parallel light, um, light curtain in the right hand application. The left hand application will be mounted, we'll be using K as a value, uh, K value of 2000 millimeters per second because it's going to be a lot closer than the K value, which is going to be 1600 for the parallel approach. So we've got 2000 times 0 0.16 plus basically zero, which is because it's eight um, times 14 minus four, 14. We get a value of 320 millimeters for the vertically mounted light curtain. With the parallel approach, we are 1200 minus 0.4 times 500. So you can see there that the value there comes out four times larger at um, 1256 millimeters. And it, again, it depends on what your drivers are, what you want to do, what you want to achieve, is space a limitation, et cetera. But generally, if you're going to be looking for a smallest safety distance uh, and smallest footprint for your machine, then the vertically mounted light curtain is going to be your um, option. So if we have a look at the calculations for floor scanners, or laser scanners. You can see the first part looks very similar, uh, S equals K times T, but then we've got this ZT and ZR. And although it may look similar, P is, this is the point where, um, as I mentioned right at the beginning when we talked about floor scanners, the T value can change. 
because we're going to be looking at different depends how many scans you're going to select before you trigger um, the activation of the device so two scans which is I believe as it comes out the box will be 62 milliseconds three scans is 92 milliseconds so that value there 30 t1 if we change between that just for the floor scanner is going to increase by 30 milliseconds and it's something as we say you've got to consider because if you're getting nuisance tripping people may try and tune it out a little bit if you're getting maybe something that just falls through the plane um which is product or whatever and you want to make sure that it's not uh, and you don't want these nuisance trips that actually may affect the safety distance t2 is machine stopping time that remains the same um and now c so c is the additional distance depending on the height of the scanning plane and the detection capability so it's the same as we looked at before with a uh, horizontally mounted light curtain uh 1200 minus 0.4 times the height um and then we've got to allow, allow some other different um safety distances so you've got a general allowance of just 150 millimeters uh, and then also you've got to have a, have a look into it and consider the reflective surfaces intense light sources how they may affect the uh the operation of the light curve of the floor scanner and it's also worth noting that you shouldn't really it's god has given that floor scanners shouldn't be mounted any higher than 300 millimeters from the floor um, it's the same distance you might notice as the bottom beam of a light curtain um, is to prevent people from crawling under um, radar s equals k times t is the same with the radar but the uh, you can't tune the the number of scans so that that will be be fixed as it is with a light curtain but then we've got ch plus ci so ch is to do with a minimum distance so we have to add 850 millimeters as a minimum distance for for this value for the radar um however you do use the 1200 by 0.4h calculation um, but if that comes out at less than 850, you must use a minimum of 850. And this is because the first one meter of a radar system is classed as a dead zone. Um, and it it may very, may well detect something in, within a meter, but it's not certified to. So a, a radar must always be at least one meter from the hazard. And then CI is to do with the inclination or, or the tilt angle. Uh, and this is because of, again it's volumetric it's going to look at a certain way uh, and the overall detected area will change um, we do have a radar specific webinar which you can find on the pilts go to stage uh, page um, because it's there's a lot more complicated and a lot more things to go into on this uh, and it's, it's a sort of a topic in itself so please if you want to know a bit more uh, you can find it at that so why is it critical to make sure devices are positioned correctly because machines will either seem to have a, a noticeable stopping time and people want to do it or it will be very quickly uh, and then it's perceived to stop instantly and that's something i've heard personally many times oh how quick does your machine stop oh it stops instantly well you know by what we've looked at earlier in this webinar that nothing stops instantly we have reaction times of devices therefore something needs to be calculated um, and however small or short they've still got to be considered within the s equals k times t plus c formula so um, it's very important to get that t value right and if you don't um, then the safety distance will be wrong and this very nice sophisticated expensive device that you've fitted and looks great uh, may not be offering the protection it should be and that you think it is or that your operators think it is so um 
you can use independent stock time measurement services and we offer that as, as many others and what we will do is come in and physically measure the stop of, stopping time of your machine and put that into the into the equation and then you can use that as a validation to make sure or if anybody gets hurt to prove that your safety devices are sufficiently far enough from the hazard that if people are using the machine correctly they cannot come into contact with, with moving parts. Uh, it might be a, a decision maker or a key factor at some point. But what you've also got to make sure is you have to continually repeat these um, these tests to prove that the stopping time in the machine hasn't increased because somebody, as we say, may increase the scans of a light curtain. They may, uh, you may have a heavier product that's on there. You may, the machine may be faster. Or it might just be general wear and tear. Break, if you've got a brake machine, the brake may be fading a little bit. And you've got to make sure that they're still the same and that the safety devices are uh, sufficiently positioned for the lifetime of the machine. So there's a couple of ways of doing it. Uh, measuring this T value, um, it, can be it can be done with a very high resolution camera. And as long as you know the, the amount of frames and you can count them frames, you can video it and do it that way or you can use a linear called linear device as we do at pilts so we've got like a mechanical finger which would initiate the stop um by going through the being detected by the device and then we have an encoder which will be with a drawstring which will be attached to the machine and then it will measure how quickly it knows from the initiation to when the machine stops and we get that and the value then is is calculated and put into a report. We will do this calculation 10 times. Okay. And we will put that and we will use the worst case scenario. So you can see here this is an example of a pass. And most likely it's all completely made up just for this, but this is what we've got here. So you can see that the values are almost for muchness, all 0 0.6 seconds. Um, you go from 0.62 something to 0.64. So we use the worst case scenario. This example says that the distance of a finger resolution light curtain is 1,370 millimeters from the hazard. The worst reading is at the 10 test is 0.6449. So we put that into the equation and 1600 times 0.6449 plus nothing because it's finger detection light curtain comes out at uh, 1032 millimeters just over a meter so you can see there they're over they're uh, over 300 millimeters a foot inside where they need to be brilliant past next one not so good so if you have a look at the values on the right hand side there you can see actually why and it, and it justifies why we do 10 readings because you can see here that, that in test five was the biggest reading 0 0.3558 test six was 0 0.1416 so there's quite a difference there quite a difference and that could be just to do with where the machine is in within its cycle uh, it could be to do with how much products on there or, or whatever it is but this is why we've got to take the worst case scenario and do various tests in this case uh, we've got a body detection light curtain so, um, and it's mounted one meter away from the hazard. So, 1600 times 0.3558, so fast stopping machine, plus 850, that's where it falls down. You've got 1.4 meters from the hazard. That's a fail because we're 400 mil away, 420 mil over where we need to be. However, the solution, you don't even have to go all the way down to a finger detection light curtain. You can go to a hand detection light curtain. So you can see there that you've got eight times 30 minus 14. So um, so eight times 16. And then it comes out then that your safety distance, so we're adding 128 as a value for C to your 570, which is your initial uh, SK times T value, comes out um, at 698, which is again way inside the thousand millimeters required so hand detection light curtain can be fitted and that will give you compliance so
So I hope that's been clear enough. We're just drawing to a finish now, guys. Uh, we kept you for, for 50 odd minutes. But we talked briefly about periodic testing. Um, and this is what there's a HSE uh, guidance document called HSG 180. Uh, and this gives guidance on how frequently these devices must be tested dependent upon the type. So for type 4 devices, and if you remember back, we talked about them, they will be PLE applications. They should be tested every six months. And this isn't a test to say, um, well, when we activate it, the machine comes to a standstill. It's this stop performance test to say, actually, the machine still comes to a standstill in the um, in the required time to allow the safety distance to be valid. So saying type four devices every six months, type two devices every 12 months. Um, and I mean, to be honest, this, is, this would be an ideal world. Most people we find actually don't even have evidence of stop performance testing uh, for many of their applications. So it's something that needs to be done, something that needs to be um, considered um, and, and, a, and a service that we can perform for you. Uh, if, if need to be. Finally, our Pilts Go To Stage channel. Uh, you can go on there. You can have a look at various other uh, webinars that we've completed for so cybersecurity, CE or UKCA marking, safe locking, Pascal, loads and loads of different uh, topics um, which you can view at your leisure. So, everybody, that's it for me today. Um, thank you for your time and I hope you all have a great weekend and um, please get in contact if you need any support or any applications we can help with regarding machinery safety. Take care and thank you again for your time. Have a good weekend.